Welcome to our very first installment of After the Sermon. This program is designed to take us deeper into the subject matter of the Sunday Sermon. Our time is limited on Sunday morning, so these episodes will allow us to further explore the message God has prepared for us. Sunday morning sermons for Shining Light Baptist Church can be found by visiting our YouTube channel or our website at slbcmarion.org. Please join me as we begin today's episode with Pastor Gary Carr, expounding on the Sunday Sermon for January 3rd, 2016. All right, let's talk about Joshua's vision. As we look at the book of Joshua, you'll see that there's three major points that we've been talking about. And the first one that we're going to dive deep into is God's promises are always trustworthy. And that's, that's true in our daily life, isn't it? We need to trust God's promises in our life because without trust, there is no faith. And God is the same yesterday, today, and he is tomorrow. So laying our trust in God and his promises allows us to use our faith and step out on that faith to strengthen our walk. So God promised Joshua in verse 5 that he would always be with him and that he has already given him the victory. Now, in today's time, when we're talking about God and his visions that he's given us, it gets a little scary sometimes because his visions are always bigger than we could possibly do by ourselves. And it's meant to be that way, because God needs the full credit when it is successful. So as Joshua gets the vision from God of taking the promised land, can you imagine that, taking an entire land for God with all the developed cities that were in place, Jericho with the 20-foot tall walls? And their little army was supposed to to take that city and the rest of the country. That is a major task. And just like Jericho, there is major walls in your life today. And God is telling you that it's time to break down those walls and seize that land for God. So he tells Joshua that you're going to do this. You're going to take the promise and you're going to cross the Jordan. And God tells us that today in Matthew 28 with the Great Commission. Verses 19 to 20 is preceded by a reference to Jesus' authority and followed by the promise of Jesus' spiritual presence among us. Both are necessary if we are to fill God's given mission. We can't do it without him. He tells us in John that he is the vine and we are the branches. And we can't do anything without him, John 15, 5. And as you look at your Jericho, whatever your personal life may be, whatever that personal Jericho is for you that God is telling you to seize back for him, and you see those tremendous walls, know this, God has promised to be with you just like he was with Joshua. He has promised you the same power that he has promised Joshua, and he's promised you the same victory as he did Joshua in those days. We just need to have the faith in trusting in God's promises. That will help you get through. The second point that we want to look at is obedience. See, when Joshua got the vision, he had to be obedient. And obedience to that vision is huge. And he got the motivation by relying upon his faith and being trustworthy in God's promises. Being successful in obedience today to God's word starts with your own walk, because we can't increase faith unless we will be obedient. Exodus 6, 10 through 12 says, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, Go and tell Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to let the Israelites go from his land. But Moses said in the Lord's presence, If the Israelites will not listen to me, then how will Pharaoh listen to me, since I am such a poor speaker? We have sometimes the ability to make excuses so that we don't have to be obedient. I can't do it. I can't do this. I'm not good at that. But can't is not in God's vocabulary. It's not in a dictionary for him because he is the all-powerful God. 
And we might as well just give up those excuses and trust in God's promises and understand that we are to be used, and it is a privilege to be used by God. Faith is key in being obedient. God's work takes God's power, and we tap into that power through faith in the Holy Spirit who lives inside of you. Our mindset when it comes to being obedient to the Lord should be like Paul's in Romans 1.1. Paul says, I am a slave of Jesus Christ, called as an apostle and singled out for God's good news. And that's what we are today. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, you have been bought and paid for by the blood of Jesus Christ. And you are his property. You belong to him. He doesn't look at us as a slave. He doesn't treat us as a slave. As a matter of fact, he calls us friend. But we should look at him as our master. He is our friend as well, but he is our master. And we are a slave to do his will. And we should want to do his will just because of what he did for us. We are called to serve, and we are singled out for his purpose. It makes it personal, doesn't it? If you just stop and think about that, when God came to Joshua, he said, Joshua, Moses is gone, and I want you to lead my people to the promised land and conquer it. And whatever vision he's given you today, he says, you are my child, and I'm singling you out for my purpose. How wonderful a feeling it is to serve a God that trusts you enough to send you on this important mission to spread the good news of Jesus Christ. And that's what he did with Joshua. We believe as humans sometimes that being obedient to God, that we are doing some kind of favor for him, and he owes us for it. Can you imagine that? The God Almighty that saved our soul from an eternity of hell, and there are folks out there that will be obedient to God, gritting their teeth and thinking, Lord, you owe me a favor for this. Isn't that amazing that someone considers themselves more important than God, that God can't get the work done without them, that he thinks God owes him? I don't think he thinks himself as a slave to the master, do you? In fact, obedience opens the door to God's care for us. Exodus 15, 26 says, he said, if you will carefully obey Yahweh, your God, do what is right in his eyes, pay attention to his commands, and keep all his statues, I will not inflict any illness on you that I inflicted on the Egyptians, for I am Yahweh, who heals you. Because we're obedient, because we obey our master, he doesn't have to level discipline against us. And we shouldn't run from that discipline if we do mess up, because it is only what's best for us. So that is why we do what we do. We be obedient so that we can find favor in the master's eyes. I call it two-by-four therapy. And two-by-four therapy, in layman's terms, is this. God gives us something to do, and if we're not going to use our faith and be obedient at it, he will bring pressures into our life. Little things, just like a shepherd when a sheep goes astray, will press his nook into the ribs of the sheep just a little bit to put them back on course. And if we ignore that little pressure, he'll apply a little more pressure. He'll keep hitting you with that two-by-four until it drives you to your knees. That's what I call two-by-four therapy. It's discipline, but it's discipline for our own good. Verse 7, Joshua chapter 1, says this, Above all, be strong and very courageous to carefully observe the whole instruction my servant Moses commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right or the left so that you will have success wherever you go. It is hugely important when you are following God's commands, being obedient to your master, that you stay focused on him. And the one way that you can stay focused on God is through meditation. Another way is through Bible study. And of course, the third way is through prayer. Always keeping God first on your mind. 
Because when we turn from the right to the left, as God was warning Joshua then, what happens is we get off track. We have a great example from Peter, who did that very thing in Matthew chapter 14, verse 30. And you probably remember the story. The disciples were out in the boat. It was late at night. The storm was there. And they saw a fellow walking across the water at them. They thought it was a ghost, and they were very afraid. But Jesus called to them and told them not to be afraid that it was him. Peter says, if it's you, my Lord, command me to come out there to be with you. And Jesus said, come. But when Peter saw the strength of the wind, he was afraid and began to sink. He cried out, Lord, save me. Peter took his eyes off of Jesus. He looked at the circumstances around him and took a human perspective and thought that he could not overcome them. That's what cripples Christians today. We start out obeying God, trusting in God's promises and his word. We start on our journey and something happens and we take our eyes off of God. We stop looking at Jesus and then we begin to look at the circumstances around us and we begin to apply human logic that we just can't overcome them. So we quit. We stop. It's like going into a hallway with the lights on, Jesus at the other end of the hallway, straight hallway, and he tells us to come to him. And before we do that, we turn out the lights, throw a bunch of marbles in the way, and then start to walk. We create so many problems because of our human perspective of things that we fail. We get in our own way when it comes to serving God. God doesn't make it difficult to serve him, to be obedient to him. He never sets us up to fail. What happens is that we take our eyes off of God and we, we humanly think with our logic that it's impossible to complete the task that he has for us. When Joshua was given the task of conquering the promised land, it was humanly impossible for his group to do so. But he believed and trusted in God's word. Did Joshua make mistakes? And we're going to see that later on. Yeah, he did. There was times that folks took their eyes off of God. But we need to understand that God is with us and that we need to keep our eyes on him first and we can get back on track. It's God logic that we need to follow, not our own. Matthew 6, 33 says, But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be provided for you. That's another promise that we can rely on in our darkest times when we serve our God. Satan is always looking to stumble you. He's always looking to cast doubt. He's always looking to sift you. But if we rely on that promise that God says that if we seek him first, all these things will be provided for you. He never sets us up to fail, and we will be victorious. Looking at verse 8, we must be prepared. Everything you go through in life is your resume in serving God. For Moses, it was 40 years learning as an Egyptian ruler learning their ways, their math, and how to lead. Forty years was in the wilderness, being a shepherd, learning to get a heart for his flock, learning how to care about them. In forty years, it was leading and caring for God's people as he took them out of Egypt. So when Satan tells you that you can't serve God because of your past, I want you to look at it as a resume to serve God. I want you to look at it not as a scar, but as a medal. It is who you are. It is the experience that God had led you through for the very moment that he caused you to be obedient. Joshua's resume was that he was with Moses as they left Egypt during the Exodus. He went through the wilderness. He saw the things that God did for them, the pillar of fire at night and the cloud in the morning. He was with Moses on the mountaintop when the Israelites chose the golden calf. He wasn't part of that. And yes, Joshua was one of the two spies that originally went into the promised land and said that they could take it. 
where the other 10 didn't. So everything that Joshua had went through led him to the moment of God using him, giving him the vision to take over for Moses and lead his people into the promised land. And everything that you have been through that leads up to this point in life, where you're standing there now, and the Holy Spirit's telling you to go forth, you're ready. Relying and trusting on God's Word, you're ready. You just need to stop the excuses and be obedient. Prepare yourself. One of the greatest ways that you can prepare yourself so that you don't get turned around, so that you don't get fear or doubt, so that Satan, when he does sift you, that you can withstand the storms and the temptations, is Bible study. For one of the greatest gifts that God has given us is his word. And we have it in so many different uh, translations. We have it in audio. We have it in video. We have it in the written word. There's nowhere that you would not be able to pick up a Bible in this country. There's commentaries to help you study. But I really want you to fall in love with the Word. That's part of being obedient. Preparing yourself to serve God is that you really need to fall in love with the Word. The Bible is not a collection of stories, fables, myths, or merely human ideas about God. The Bible is God's inspired Word. It is inspired and trustworthy. We should read it and apply it to our lives. How are you going to lean on God's promises if you don't know what they are? How are you going to strengthen your faith if you have no idea where to start? The Bible is our standard for testing everything else that claims to be true. It's our safeguard against false teachings and our source of guidance on how we should live our lives. And yes, it's the instruction manual for discipling young and weak Christians as well. There are too many turns in this life, too many detours, too many temptations, and you will fall if you don't know the right way to go. God's Word gives you all the answers to what you need. How much time do you spend in God's Word? So let me sum up by saying this, as we look at the vision that was given to Joshua by God. Three things that I want you to take from chapter 1, as God has started you on your path for the vision and calling that He wants you to do. First of all, God's Word is trustworthy. His promises are never broken. We can count on those. We can rely on those. We can grab hold of those in the middle of the storm. You can hang on to them as the water hits you hard from the rain and the hell that comes down upon you and life's misery and say, it's going to be okay because God is trustworthy and he has given us his promise and I'm going to hold on to that. And then you have to be obedient. The second point. You have to be obedient. Get rid of the excuses. Let them go. Don't even try to use them, because none of them are good enough. Can't is not in God's vocabulary, and if He's called you to do it, you can do it. You can be successful. Don't doubt yourself. Use your faith. Rely on God's promises, and be obedient to the Holy Spirit. Take your past that he's given you and use it as your resume to lead you into the future of following God and being obedient in the vision that he's given you. And third, prepare yourself. Let me tell you a little story. When I first became a Christian, I was about 16 years old. And um, I will tell on myself, I went to church not to hear God's word. I went to church because there was a pretty girl there that I wanted to meet. And that night I met the Lord instead. And I was so excited about meeting God that night. I went home that night when I was 16 years old. I was aglow. 
I was on the top of the mountain because my heart was so full. I had found the thing that made me whole. I found a relationship with God. I stayed up half the night with the Bible, and I was preaching in the mirror to a group of thousands. I was just so excited to say, to speak God's Word. Never picking up the Bible really before that night. There I was 12 hours into knowing God, and I thought I knew it all. The next day, I had a part-time job. I went to work, and I thought by just me saying what the experience that happened to me that night, people would come to Jesus. And I met this fellow at work, nice enough fella. And I started to tell him about my experience and that he needed Jesus in his life. And let me tell you, this fella knew logically the Word of God. He knew the written Word of God well. He re read it all the time. But he didn't have the heart knowledge of what it meant. So he could literally tell you the Scriptures, but he never sought God. He never had that Holy Spirit in him to give him the heart knowledge of what it truly meant. And as he started to play with me when, with scriptures, he just tore me up. He shook my faith. He twisted my thought process. And when I went home that night, I was devastated. I just couldn't understand why those thousands in the mirror that night before who give their life to God didn't happen that day. But yet I was a casualty of the spiritual war. So I called my pastor and I asked him what was going on. I thought for sure that having known who God is was all that it would take to turn people to Jesus. And he told me, he said, that's a great start because that's your testimony, but you need to prepare yourself for the spiritual war that is coming. So I met with him for almost a year, three nights a week in Bible study. He taught me from Genesis all the way to the maps. He taught me the meanings. He taught me the theories. He taught me the processes. And at age 17, I took over a youth leadership position at the church. And God blessed it. And from that point on, I have been learning ever since. My life is my resume. It's been unfolding ever since God has taken charge and led it. In over 30-some years, I have been down a lot of different roads. I've had experienced a lot of things. But nothing prepares you for serving God more than God's Word. So those are the things that you need to be successful when God gives you a vision and tells you to go to work for Him. Trust His Word, His promises. Be obedient and prepare yourself for the spiritual battle to come because Satan is looking to sift you. God bless you. I hope you enjoyed this tonight. And we'll see you next week when we take the second step into the journey of Joshua and his vision to conquer the promised land. Good night. We'd like to thank you for joining us for today's episode. Please join us again next week as Pastor Carr continues to explore God's wisdom in the book of Joshua. Until then, good night and may God bless you.